This is Orsi Official Old Guy at oldguytalkstome.com, a podcast dedicated to helping older guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. It's for women, too. Each week, I bring you a special guest to help you create that life that you imagine for yourself and those that you love. We talk anti-aging medicine, personal growth, relationships, and sex, vices, and other topics that many don't want to talk about but need to. Just because you're getting older doesn't mean you have to be old. Also, if you want to know three ways to get laid more frequently without begging, go to oldguytalks.com and opt in. When you do, you're going to get my important video on three simple things you can do to get laid more frequently without begging so you don't have to turn in your man card. And ladies, you may want your man to know these things because I think you'll like them too. Additionally, you'll be notified weekly when a new podcast episode is ready for you to consume. Periodically, I will share with you other stuff that will help you create that life that you want for yourself and those that are important to you. Don't want to miss anything? Be sure to subscribe, share, and review this podcast. Did you know that there are 76 additives that have been approved by the FDA that can be added to wines? You want a wine with shit in it that may not be good for you? Well, there is an option for wines that have been produced naturally, organically, that have been tested, that have no sugar. And when they don't have any sugar, that means that they're ketosis and intermittent fasting friendly. These wines have been produced with a great deal of care on small farms and are available to you. How do you get them? Find out by going to www.oldguytalks.com backslash dry farms dry farms all one word with an s and find out more and with your initial order you can get a bottle for one penny that's right a bottle for one penny and they taste great they taste great don't wait don't hesitate don't procrastinate get those wines now this is Horace Official, Old Guy at oldguytalksme.com, a podcast dedicated to helping older guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. And part of that kick-ass life, well, is that you don't want to kick off because you got a bad ticker. Uh, you know, that, 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 would be a, that would put an abrupt end to creating that kick-ass life for yourself. And today, I have a chance to have uh, Dr. Abid Hussein and uh, I had a chance to hear him speak at the World Peptide Conference. I'm sure that's a high on everyone's note to attend that meeting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's almost good as, as Comic-Con. It's that's almost right. as big. <laughs> it's almost as big as Comic-Con. Uh, but I had a chance to hear him speak. And I just a little bit about him is uh, after eight years working as an invasive cardiologist in a traditional hospital setting in New Jersey, Dr. Abi Hussein grew tired of working within the limits of the hospital system. Rather than treating patients after adverse cardiovascular events, he wanted to address the root cause of heart disease and stop it before it started. Dr. Hussein stepped away from his position and moved out west, where he spent years seeking out education and training dedicated to heart disease prevention, anti-aging therapies, and functional medicine. In Dr. Boone's decade of practicing medicine, he has rarely encountered a colleague with such, with such a similar outlook towards medicine and pa same passion for eradicating heart disease and stroke. In addition to being a triple board certified physician and expert in preventive cardiology, Dr. Hussein offers expertise in peptide therapy, hormone support, and functional medicine. As we continue to succeed at preventing life altering diseases, the need for regenerative medicine increases. After all, what's the point of living to 100 if you can't enjoy it with a strong body and sharp mind? Dr. Hussein's unique skill sets allows Boone Heart to expand our offerings while maintaining our central mission to prevent heart disease, stroke, cancer, and dementia. Aside from being a dedicated physician, Dr. Hussein is also an accomplished painter and mixed martial artist. He believes that a balanced life complete with a divisive, diverse set of interests is the healthiest way to navigate in an increasingly stressful and toxic world. So welcome to, to Old Guy Talks to Me, Dr. Hussein. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for All having right. me. Thanks. My pleasure. So uh, I always like to ask this question. The uh, first of my guests is, what's the most important thing you did today? The most important thing today was I did my workout this morning. I did okay. my uh, I did uh, my deadlifting and shoulder workout. It's been a little bit difficult. My sleep's been a little off. So I made it a point to get that in. 
because uh, if I don't do that, the rest of my day goes south. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I have a ritual. It involves uh, exercise, aerobic, and and uh, weightlifting uh, on alternate days, and then I do a little meditation, mm -hmm. journaling, and and some uh, uh, some other work to kind of set the tone for the day. And the, if I don't go through my routine, the day sucks. It's really, yeah. it's, it's really, it just it's very like important to start that morning process with the the routine get, to get things going. Yeah, yeah, because my it's, it's important. So let me ask you. Um, when you left the hospital setting, and I, I kind of, I, I tell my friends, I have two kinds of doctors. I have my disease-based doctors, <laughs> and I have my health anti-aging doctors, mm -hmm. <laughs> and rarely did the two ever cross paths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, um, what is different in your approach to treating cardiovascular disease, uh, since you started at the, at the Boone Clinic? Mm -hmm. uh, how how's that changed from where you were when you were in, in a traditional hospital setting? When I was in a traditional hospital setting, we looked at uh, a limited number of biomarkers, and we also looked at that range, that perspective, with a, with a very uh, accepting wide um, margin. So when we would test for blood tests, something that was within the normal range is okay that means you don't have an issue, even if the symptoms would suggest that you do. Mm -hmm. um, and that was an easy way to dismiss or to uh, get it, uh, you know, to deal with complicated or subtle, um, not severe symptoms. Um, because in the hospital based setting, we're, you know, I'm dealing with more, I'm dealing with life threatening issues, I'm dealing right. with emergencies. And those are very obvious. Those fall outside of the normal ranges. It's very easy to identify. And we can, most of the time, we can figure out what's going on, unless it's a, a zebra that's in the hospital setting. Sure, sure. But, um, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned, uh, nor I'm sorry, go ahead and mean to interrupt yeah. you. So, so when we look at the, 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 look at it from a preventative perspective, and when I look at it after going through all of that functional medicine and anti-aging um, education, that lab testing range has to be looked at much more carefully. Our idea of normal is should be readjusted. It's not that if you're within the normal range, then it's not a problem. Got to listen to the symptoms. And we want people to be in the upper range of those normals because that's the optimal range. Yeah. You know, to give you an example of thyroid as a perfect example, mm -hmm. people are always told you're within the normal range. You don't have a problem with your thyroid. Meanwhile, we know that in the upper range of normal, people do best, but we don't seem to make that 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 jump in our understanding because they were never told. We were never told that in medical school. Yeah, I think you know. Uh, I I saw some stuff from Tuvison, and I don't know if you know who he is. The guy, he's he's the doctor who actually uh, publishes the, the, the ranges. He's the data that they look at. He's from Harvard, mm -hmm. and uh, he made an interesting comment that 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 data, those ranges, are actually epidemiological. And then they're not meant to treat individual patients. And I think the thyroid, thyroid thing is interesting. Also, uh, uh, myself, I'm, I'm, I admit it fully, uh, I've been a, on uh, testosterone optimization for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've, I've watched the, the ranges drop mm -hmm. you know, over, over the years of what's yeah. considered normal. And it's kind of like, well, you know, I'm, uh, you know what, what's, what was considered normal you know, 15 years ago would be considered like super high today. And they literally, I just, uh, within the last few months, because uh, I get tested regularly, mm -hmm. uh, they dropped from, I think it was like uh, 1100, uh, the high range to 960. And yeah. it's kind of like, so see, uh, for me, I was, I refer to it as the average of unhealthy people mm -hmm. uh, is what those yeah. values are. It's kind of like, you wouldn't want to be a uh, average BMI. in that mm -hmm. people. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, when you talk about court, uh, cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you see as, as the root causes of that? Root cause is inflammation. It, when, we're, when, we're looking at, uh, when we look at coronary artery disease or more specifically atherosclerosis, it's inflammation. Uh, the, and the, the bystander that rides in on the coattails is, is cholesterol. Cholesterol follows inflammation. So finding the root cause of inflammation is usually very difficult and sometimes remains a very mysterious, uh, mysterious cause, but so that leaves us with following the next best, uh, the next best marker, which is um, which is the cholesterol. 
So, uh, you know, it gets cholesterol gets a bad rap because of that, but that's not really what we want to treat. We want to find out what's causing inflammation. And that can be a multifactorial issue. It can be everything from, from just your diet, exercise, metabolic derangement. It can be, uh, you know, a cellular issue. It can be an environmental issue. It can be a genetic issue. There, there's just so many factors that play into it, which is why it's hard to find a singular cause. Yeah, uh, that's, that's kind of interesting. Now, when I listened to you speak a few weeks ago, uh, what I found interesting was you talking about uh, reversing the effects of uh, heart disease mm -hmm. uh, you, using a, uh, uh, what you call, and I'm, I'm going to use this, a, uh, you talk about the incretin family of endogenous peptides. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, GLP-1 and GIP. And so tell us a little bit about those and mm -hmm. what they're doing. And then we're, I think we kind of want to go through the effects that they have in, in various things that, that uh, sure. actually I went through your lecture and kind of mm -hmm. gone through it. Yeah, the, that family, they're called incretin peptides because they are released from the, in, the intestine after we eat. And mm -hmm. they are, they, they're increased, when we have a, a load of glucose that we eat, it increases it more, it causes more release of insulin than it would if we have insulin just shot directly into our veins, mm -hmm. or not insulin, sugar directly into our veins. So that tells us that the gut has, has a very important role in pancreatic and, and pancreatic health as well as uh, maintaining blood glucose. So that family of, of hormones that come from the gut are called incretin peptides. And incretin is short for increase of uh, I, I N, incre increase of, uh, of something uh, insulin. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So I forgot the, the in between there, but it's uh, insulin increasing after we eat. And so, um, you know, they're, they're made up of GLP-1 and GIP or, uh, or it's a gastric inhibitory peptide. That's the short version of it. It's become a longer name over the years oh, okay. uh, because it involves many more peptides than we used to think. But the, the GLP-1 receptor, the GLP-1 peptide has become a very researched um, uh, peptide. It was originally isolated from the Gila monster saliva and venom. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a peptide that, it, that crosses all, you know, all, that, I mean, I know it's hilarious. What, it's, where, a, it's hilarious. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. what was the other, the other thing was uh, from, uh, uh, sheep sperm, something. Like that. <laughs> that. I mean, it was kind of like, who goes out? What's that's somebody right. doesn't have a life? They're, they're out there checking out the. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't have a life. They, mm -hmm. Thank God they don't have a life, but but it's kind of a thing. But yeah. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just kind no, of. That's like, okay. I mean, he was from Gila monsters. So it's just yeah. Kind of like, it, like, so it's uh. So what it does is um um it's it's used it's a peptide that is really uh created by most vertebrates early in development so this is something that crosses all, all vertebrates and if you take a, that same compound from another animal and inject it to into a human it'll do the same thing so oh, okay that's yeah so it's a very fundamental uh, uh peptide and um and it, it uh, increases, you know, from a, looking at our pancreatic health and our metabolic health, it increases the function of the, of the pancreas to secrete insulin, as well as reduce glucagon, which is important in managing uh, glucose after we eat, which is when it's going to spike the most. Oh. So it's, it's got short ranging and far ranging effects. Those are the short range effects. And when it's stimulated in a long term way, the way our medications do now, we see that it actually affects uh, the, on a cellular level, the health of the endoplasmic reticulum, which is what creates all of the proteins that are sent out to our body, proteins and messengers. Sure. So uh, let's talk, I want to kind of back up a little bit here because yeah. some of our audience may not be familiar. What are peptides? Mm -hmm. and, they're, and, and can you talk about some that are produced in the body and then some that are made that are synthetic? Yeah. Peptides are uh, on the most fundamental uh, way to describe them is they are mini proteins. So uh, the, if you look at the building block of proteins, they are amino acids. So if we take an amino acid and sequence them, put them in sequence, one that's greater than 50 or more, or maybe even greater than 100 is called a, is called a protein. If it's, if it's 
uh, 50 to 100 uh, amino acids, that's a polypeptide. If it's less than 50, that's called a peptide. Mm -hmm. So there are small sequences of, of amino acids that are used as messenger molecules to communicate intracellularly, so in, within the cell or across the body. So it is something that our body uses to maintain efficiency, to communicate what's going on, to increase and reduce or our metabolism if needed. Um, you know, and a, and a peptide that you, it's, they've been used, so they're part, they're part of our, our natural, uh, natural regulation. They're part of natural function. And then they've also been used uh, as therapeutics. They've used in medications for a hundred years. The first oh, really? one, we, yeah, the first one that we know about is an insulin. Insulin is a peptide. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. 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 So, and, and you know, uh, one of the things, because when, when you talk about peptides, everybody will Google it and you see there's a lot of uh, bad things said about peptides. And so yeah. you got to, I think you got to be careful about your sources of peptides. That, exactly. That's the key. You have to be careful about the source. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, because that's that stuff that you buy on the internet without a prescription is probably, yeah. probably not what it says it is. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You can't trust the, the quality. And then if, if it's, if it's going to be injected into our bodies, you really have to make sure that it is, uh, it is, you know, sterile and well controlled. Yeah. Pharmaceutical grade. That, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So let's talk about uh, some of these uh, ingredients. Uh, what, what kind of effects do they have in terms of antioxidants? So they, they uh, improve the, the antioxidant function indirectly and directly. Um, one of the ways is that they, they will control glucose metabolism. So glucose metabolism, uh, if, if glucose gets unregulated, it will cause uh, it through without, en without any real enzyme action, just excess amounts of glucose will change proteins in our body and they will cause uh, oxidant stress because the body ends up having to, um, it, it changes the, the pH and it also changes the structure of, uh, of, of many of the proteins in our body. And then it also, and then when it does that, it also, those stimulate other receptors. So it starts this cascade and then our body has to try and, and cope with the extra, uh, the extra glucose that's come in um, and by, and by doing that, it, it, it starts, uh, it, well, it, it has to rev up the uh, mitochondria and my, and revving up the mitochondria causes, uh, oxidative stress because when you rev up the mitochondria, the energy system, it's also the antioxidant, um, uh, machine or the antioxidant organelle in our body. It can also, um, it also gets overworked and at a certain point, will start or it won't be able to manage all of the stress that's being happened with metabolizing all of that that sugar uh, the the reason why sugar is such an issue is because it is it's not an efficient fuel source it is an important fuel source at certain times it's, it's a great fuel source for short-term energy for short-term emergency needs but when we look at it being exposed to it in long term it creates more toxins than say metabolizing fat. So we, we do best when we're metabolizing fat, we get more energy out of it and we create the least amount of toxins. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us, um, let's go into the uh, anti-inflammatory effects. Mm -hmm. The anti-inflammatory effects um, are associated with, uh, it, it stimulates specific products that uh, will, will affect us, uh, will reduce inflammation immediately. And it does that through also through the mitochondria, but also through other organelles. And then it also, um, so it, it also reduces inflammation through the, um, well, it's, uh, it works again through, I mean, a lot of it has to do with the, what's called the protein unfolding response and work through the endoplasmic reticulum. So okay. the and, what, and the endoplasmic reticulum is is a, what surrounds the cell. It's it's a it's a it's a small part of the cell that okay. is it's that's connected to the nucleus that de okay. that does all of the protein packaging and shipping in the in the okay. cell. Uh -huh. So you know when we look at when we look at longevity, there's a couple of things. You know, it's a complex uh, system of things that needs to be that needs to be uh, integrated. You know, we look at the DNA, we look at the mitochondrial function, and we look at the, the endoplasmic reticulum function. And that's where the, where the protein function comes in. 
Okay. So, so it's, it's part of that piece of looking at longevity. Um, but to, to take a step back, it, so it also, so as, as it, uh, it, it stimulates us on a, on a genomic level to stimulate those pathways that help reduce inflammation as well. So it's got short-term effects and long-term effects that do all of those things. Okay. Um, let, let's talk about uh, antihypertensive effects. Mm -hmm. It has a direct effect on the lining of the arteries uh, by increasing what's called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a, is a, is a neurohormone, can be sometimes even be a gas that helps our arteries open up and relax and become more pliable. Mm -hmm. um, so it helps uh, the lining of the artery. And then it also helps the actual uh, muscular part of the artery too, because that reduces the amount of fibrosis and tension. Uh, and then it also, nitric oxide is also an antioxidant. So when it, when it helps boost that, it helps reduce a lot of the stress that happens on the, on the vessels. So, and it helps uh, the vessels stay healthy as well as react, uh, importantly, defensively to stressors like cholesterol, like other oxidant issues. Um, GLP-1s don't, they modestly reduce blood pressure, uh, but they really do help va vascular health nicely. So uh, let's, then this led me into, into, you just mentioned uh, cholesterol and triglycerides. What's the action there? Yeah, it'll, it'll, um, it'll, so as the multiple, multiple ways, it reduces the amount of cholesterol that can get underneath the lining of the artery and, and embed itself underneath there. That's how we get plaque formation. That mm -hmm. cholesterol will, will be able to um, go between that lining. In, it's called the endothelium. gets underneath there and goes into, in, into the intima. When, with GLP-1, it helps to promote nitric oxide, which reduces that. It also helps to uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists or that, that hormone also helps to reduce the, um, the enzymes or the, in, the markers that will attach uh, cell pro um, immune products to the lining. Mm -hmm. So immune products and cholesterol, they get underneath the lining of the artery and they combine to form plaque. Now, so, you know, now do, they, do these actually reverse these processes? This can, yeah. Yeah, okay. if, uh, so what happens is when, when uh, the cholesterol gets underneath there and the, and, the, and the immune products get underneath there, they get triggered by immune products to become more toxic. So mm -hmm. every step of that process gets uh, reduced and gets affected by, by GLP-1 and incretins. It reduces the amount that can stick onto the lining. It reduces the amount that get underneath the endothelium. And then the ones that do get into the endothelium and underneath there, it reduces the number that can actually convert into uh, toxic oxidized LDL. Yeah. And then, so let's also talk about the cardioprotective effects. Mm -hmm. It helps, uh, it, well, it helps direct cardiac metabolism. So it helps the, the, the heart muscle utilize glucose in a better mm -hmm. way. And then it also helps the muscle, the heart muscle by being an antioxidant as well. So uh, the muscle itself is affected. And then when we reduce the oxidative burden, when there's less uh, oxidative stress, our, our heart is able to be more resilient. So when it has uh, a stressor to it, when it has lack of oxygen, when it has damage to it, it can be, it can bounce back better and less damage happens to it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is uh, they are, and you have to tell everyone what this word means. Sure. A, 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 a apoptotic. Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? So apoptotic is, uh, apoptosis is also known as programmed cell death. Uh -huh. So when our cells have their lifespan and when they start to become less efficient, um, then there's a trigger that can get switched to tell our cell that you're not, it's not, I'm not working well. I need to start deciding whether I want to, well, that it's time to go. Cause, because if I, if I die properly, if I stop functioning and die properly, it can be, I can be recycled and then reused by the body. Uh, that's called apoptosis. So it's a programmed cell death that's healthy for the body so it can be recycled. If it doesn't happen, and, and apoptosis also is a, uh, another, um, uh, yeah, it, uh, I was thinking of autophagy, but apoptosis, yeah, that's uh, when we have programmed cell death. If it doesn't happen at that time frame, 
uh, or if the switch is improper, or is not functioning well, the cell can, become, can continue to stay alive, but it doesn't function well, not efficient, and then release toxic products. And it call, goes into what's called senescence. So a senescent cell is a bad cell, basically like a zombie cell. That's how we describe okay. it. It's, it's not really alive, it's not really dead, but it releases a lot of bad products, bad toxins. So these products, the GLP-1 receptor agonists or GLP-1, uh, uh, they are one of the few things that allow us to have uh, apoptosis and autophagy or it regulates apoptosis better so that um, if when our cells do get to that point where it can't function well, it'll know to do the switch as opposed to staying around and becoming a toxic issue. Yeah. So um, now there are different types of, of, of the synthetic uh, semi-glutides. Yes. Okay. And, and so I want to go, go into that. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm just was uh, found that uh, recently the FDA approved one, one of them for uh, weight management. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, the way these, so these medications help with weight in two ways. Uh, they, the, the most common side effect that all of them have is they slow down gastric motility. They will make your, the food passage through the gut slower. So anytime anybody takes those, they need to be on, uh, a, uh, on, on fiber supplements. So that in and of itself, slowing down the motility makes them feel more full with less food but it also affects the, the brain centers for cravings and for feeding. So not only do they feel more full after eating, but they don't want to, they don't want to eat as much. Mm -hmm. So uh, because of that, people often do lose weight uh, fairly reliably on the medication. Um, when they take the medication at a higher dose, because it can be given at a higher dose because it doesn't cause low blood sugar, it just regulates blood sugar. At a higher dose, it has a higher weight loss effect. And the, also the interesting thing about this is that when you, uh, the more weight you have, the more you can lose. And as you get closer to ideal body weight, weight loss starts to plateau. Oh, okay. So that's, yeah. kind of, uh, that's kind of interesting. So, you know, you talked about dosing. Um, uh, and I understand that you start off with a lower dose and then work yeah. your way up. And wh why is that? Because the, your, your, our systems can't tolerate a large dose of this at once, it'll induce severe constipation if, and probably diarrhea and vomiting. So uh, yeah, it, <laughs> because we release a small amount of it after, after we eat and then it goes away quickly. Um, so we need to build our tolerance up to a more, more long-term exposure as well as a mm -hmm. higher dose exposure. Yeah. Um, and depending on the medication you use, it's going to be a once a day dose or a once a week dose. Um, but we start at a low dose and then monitor the symptoms and the side effects. The, the, the most common side effect, as I said, is going to be constipation. Uh, the other ones are uh, nausea. It can come in waves, often lasts, for most people, it'll last for about 10 minutes or less. Very, it's subtle, it go, comes and goes. And then the more you're on it, the more it dissipates. Okay. The less often it happens. Sure. Uh, the other one is going to be gastric reflux. So a little bit of heartburn that also can start to, to disappear the longer you're on it, but it can be significant in the first few weeks. Um, then the other one is the, the you know, the, the, there's a subset of patients that don't do well with the medication. And we'll know right away. They'll have severe nausea, severe vomiting and diarrhea to the point where it interferes with everyday life and functioning. So those people have to be stopped. And there's a really small percentage of people that have a very bad adverse reaction where it's the same symptoms, but they also have fatigue and they really can't, they really incapacitated by the, the, um, the nausea because it just, it keeps them from doing anything. Mm -hmm. So that's a really small subset. I've seen one patient have that effect and then a handful of people that have not been able to tolerate it, but it's usually a well-tolerated medication once you can get past those initial side effects. Hmm. Okay. Uh, are there any contraindications to, uh, to, to using this? The contraindications are uh, pancreatitis because we are stimulating the pancreas. Uh, the, the two other, there's two other contraindications which are a little softer, but uh, 
it's, uh, it's certainly a, a hypersensitivity to the medication. That's another one. But medullary thyroid cancer and pancreatic cancer, those are two softer contraindications because some of the rat studies showed that it increased uh, incidence of those two cancers. Uh, but no human studies have shown that to be a problem for humans. Mm -hmm. and, um, and definitely for the thyroid, uh, we have no incidence of pancreatic cancer. And, and what's also interesting is that taking metformin at the same time reduces that risk of uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, and they still don't know why they saw that in the rats. Uh, they think that uh, the, the pancreatic issue could be because it increases the health and the, multiple, the, the, the production of a certain subtype of pancreatic cell. Mm -hmm. That helps with pancreatic mass and diabetes for humans, but in rats, you know, they have a higher percentage and a different distribution of those cells. So it might be an issue in rats, but not humans. So now as a, as a, as a practical matter, mm -hmm. if, if let's say that you are a diabetic, is this something that you should look at to maybe reverse your diabetes? Yeah, definitely. This is uh, the first of, of multiple medications that look at diabetes, that treat diabetes in a different way. Mm -hmm. we, we don't, we're not looking at just shoving the insulin or not the insulin, the glucose into the cell and, and then making the cell become inefficient. We're, we're looking at actually metabolizing the glucose in a more uh, efficient way in a better way and in a way that promotes longevity, uh, promotes weight loss. So just about every diabetic, well, even guidelines are starting to reflect this because first line agents are metformin. And then after that, we look at the GLP-1 receptor agonists um, mm -hmm. and, and other ones in that arena. Um, sure. the, the older medications like uh, so sulfonylureas are not quite as preferred anymore because they have side effect profiles like weight gain and other ones that don't help diabetics. Yeah. Yeah, which is one of the things you don't want to do when you're diabetic is gain yeah. weight. I've, I've never seen a diabetic that needs to gain weight. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's been the thing. Um, are there any other uses for uh, some glutide? Yeah, yeah. The, there are, in every sub, sub organ that we're researching it in, it's been shown to have some positive effects. So let's, I will start from the top down. It's being used to, as a, to, it's being researched for prevention of Alzheimer's and prevention of dementia. That's actually the, how it was initially being studied. It was initially being studied as, a, as an Alzheimer's drug, but they saw that it had such profound glucose control effects that it got rebranded as a, as a diabetic medication. Mm -hmm. So we know that, uh, so there are potential benefits for um, prevention of Alzheimer's and even maybe treatment for low grade um, uh, dementia. Those are studies that are happening. Uh, so we looked at uh, vascular health, as you're looking at your carotids, things like that. It's being studied for bone health to help uh, reverse and slow down osteoporosis. Um, it's being looked at for, um, for uh, kidney health to see, because it helps improve uh, renal function as well. Um, it, you know, the, in every organ that, that shows, that has uh, GLP-1 receptors, there are, there, we're seeing positive outcomes with use of these medications. Yeah. So how pervasive is the use of these in the field of cardiology? It's not, it's really almost uh, absent in the use of cardiology because, it, because it's been branded as a, as a diabetic medication. It's been left to the, to the arena of the primary care physician or the endocrinologist. Mm -hmm. But really, every cardiologist should be looking at this because it is part of the risk factor management of coronary artery disease. It's mm -hmm. got weight loss. It's got reduction of inflammation. It's got reduction of oxidative stress, glucose management, cholesterol. And those are all the things that we that cardiologists need to do as our bread and butter. Yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, I'm, I'm I'm listening to you describe all this. It, it seems to me, it seems like it, it's kind of a a one. Uh, a one medication and you hit a lot of things and you hit them at the root cause. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we use it a lot at the, at the practice here, because we know that it's a, uh, it's a new way to treat diabetes and coronary disease. And it has 
so many studies showing that it's proven it's a proven benefit and you know through my understanding of peptides it's also you know a, a fantastic peptide to improve uh, you know longevity it, it helps us in so many different ways that i almost feel negligent if i see somebody that is not on it that needs to be on it so mm -hmm. i you know we use it regularly in our practice yeah so i'm, I'm sure a lot of our, our, our yeah, i'm sure you get this asked ask this question all the time in your clinic does my insurance cover it it, it that can be a little bit of a game, but we have been getting insurance to, to pay for it. Problem is, even when insurance pays for it, it, it may still be expensive. Your out of pocket cost mills may still be high, mm -hmm. but we have been getting insurance to pay for it, especially if you're already on metformin. So if it, as as it has been so widely accepted as a therapeutic for therapeutic benefit, that insurance mm -hmm. companies have adopted it very quickly. Yeah. Now, does that have, uh, uh, is there any, any relationship to insurance acceptance of a body mass index or, or, a, or as you mentioned, cholesterol and triglycerides? Is that factor? Yet. We haven't seen that yet. Okay. All right. Okay. And uh, yeah, because that's, I'm sure that's always, that's, that's, that's quite, I'm sure you get that asked that question all the time in your yeah. office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's a common question. And it's, it, the other thing to remember is it's an injectable. It's not, uh, it's mm -hmm. not a capsule or anything like that. A lot of people are adverse to needles, so they've created a, a oral form uh, of, uh, of oral form of GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, or oral form of semaglutide. That's okay, but it's got a lot of limitations to how you can administer it. You've got to take it at a certain time without any other medications. It's basically in the morning, um, and no, you know you can only have a certain amount of water, nothing else. And it's got a very specific, and then the amount we can deliver in that uh, in that capsule is less than what we could with an injection. Sure, sure, okay. And I'm sure there's some people that'll be listening. Said, do you do telemedicine? Yes, I do telemedicine. I have uh, licenses in multiple states, and uh, and even and regardless of that, yeah, telemedicine is is part of what we do at the Boone Heart. Uh, Institute. Yeah, yeah, and and do they as far as how's that process work in in your office as far as the telemedicine? So we would, if they want to have a telemedicine visit, we'd have that, we'd get a set of their recent labs, set, get them set up with a Zoom or a phone call meeting, and then go over their labs, go over their current history and physical, um, and then determine what other labs we need to get, and then, uh, and then go, go over those. Alternatively, what we would do is we would just get those labs and then see what we need to fill out our assessment get all of that on the front end and do a visit. So we go over everything all at once and then we can have therapy lined up afterwards. Okay, uh, all right. That's and you have, method. Yeah. now you, you have uh, several different programs in your in your office. And by the way, we're gonna put in the, uh, the website to, uh, to boonheart.com in the, in the program notes. Tell us a little bit about some of the different programs that you have at, at your clinic. The, uh, we, so we specialize in prevention of heart disease, but we take all cardiac disease. So we, you know, I'm, I'm trained as a conventional cardiologist. We have another cardiologist working here. And then we have Dr. Boone as well, who's well experienced with cardiac disease. So we, we can take all comers. Mm -hmm. uh, specializing in prevention doesn't necessarily mean that we don't take people after they've had an event, because that's the mm -hmm. same process. After you had a heart attack or you have heart failure, this, mm -hmm. you use the same medications. And this, the processes of reversing those diseases are the same as trying to prevent them. So uh, we take we can take all comers and the programs you know we can do we can see patients as they want to be seen a la carte um, what we do is we uh, do those labs and on the front end and then we, we want to do an assessment of, of biochemical uh, risk factors anatomic issues electrical issues so sometimes you know we can do it all a lot of things via telemedicine especially the lab tests uh, which we would send a a um a uh, requisition form to them and they could do the labs where they are. We would get them back and go over them. And then if, if they can come to Denver, uh, then we would have them come into the office and do a thorough head to toe cardiovascular testing to get mm -hmm. us, give, give us an idea what correlates with the lab tests physically and where we need to be more aggressive and where we need to focus our attention. So everybody gets an individualized uh, prescription plan for their specific um, genetics and their their um, biochemical uh, makeup. Um, so the, we have a concierge program where you basically pay a membership fee 
And that includes all the testing and all the blood work. We do it annually, have you come in, uh, get all that done or after a day in the office, follow up after three weeks to go over everything. And then they can call us and contact us, email or call however they need to, to make sure they understand what's going on and get all their medications. And then we continue to follow them to make sure that they're, they're tolerating them. And then after a year, we review everything again to see how we've regressed or what else needs to be done. Uh, that's the concierge program. The a la carte program is basically the same thing, except we piecemeal out the costs so that you can do them, you know, you, that you can come in and do them as you see fit. If you, you know, the benefit of the concierge program is you pay one fee and you can contact us as much as you want. Mm. A la carte basically means, you know, if you have some extra issues, if we need to do another office visit, then those are things that we may have to charge for. But, you know, and, and it, the only benefit is that, uh, you know, the only thing is that it may end up being a larger cost up front because we end up doing all the testing, get a couple of visits lumped together, and then, you know, we may not need too much afterwards. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I would say this has been fascinating, uh, you know, this, especially talking about cardiovascular disease, because as, as we get older, that's something that, that a lot of us face. Yeah. And especially if you have a, pre, a familial history of it, uh, that's also a, a, an issue. And mm -hmm. so uh, that's something that the old guy uh, does have. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. you know, the, all these risk factors and, and genetic issues were kind of uh, nebulous. They weren't really that well defined. And the more we look at medicine, the more advances we have, the more we're able to start defining these risk factors. Yeah. Um, and that's what's really gratifying about practicing here. We're, we're, start, we, we're at the front end of all of these, these technologies and we really get to find out what, you know, what the, the true risk factors are for a lot of people. Yeah. So one last, I have one last question before we sign off and I appreciate mm -hmm. you being on here. Um, let's talk about telomeres and what's your, what's your feeling about those? So, you know, cause I, I think some people tell me, I hear some people say it doesn't mean anything. Some people say it's, 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 it's the bomb. It's, it means <laughs> everything. Uh, what's, what's your perspective on those? My perspective is that telomeres are important. We know that people with short, shortened telomeres have shorter lifespans. That's an indisputable fact. So we can't ignore that. But I also know I also believe that telomeres are not the not the, the central thing that we need to be looking at. It's one of the multiple pieces in the longevity puzzle. You know, we need to look at mitochondrial function, DNA function, telomere length, protein function. Um, and then we need to look at the, you know, inflammation, metabolic risk factors. So there's a lot that goes into inflammation and, um, you know, the, that evidence that people with shorter telomeres are, have short, yeah, they have a little shorter lifespan. That's undeniable. You know, what else is associated with that? That is what we need to be, we need to tease apart. And it may be that it's just an association as opposed to a direct, uh, direct um, uh, longevity reducing issue. So I, I think it's something to keep on the radar. I think it's something to, to manage, but I don't think it's the end all. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on the program and talking about this and telling us about this great new medication that's out there mm -hmm. and how it's used and what the opportunities are to reverse some of the effects of, of cardiac disease. And I think it's very, very exciting, including and also diabetes and a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, so that's definitely. great. Thank you very much. Thank you for having this me. Is this is Oris, the official old guy at oldguytalkstome.com. We're all about creating a kick-ass life for yourself and those that you love. And I want you to do several things. One, I want you to subscribe, share, and review, and rate. And if you give me a bad review, uh, I don't mind. I love my trolls. I love my trolls. I like to feed my trolls because, well, actually, they, they bump your ratings up. <laughs> Until next time. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you like what you heard and learned, then be sure to do three things. One, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Two, share this with someone who may need to hear it also. And it may be your significant other. And three, review it. Give me a good review. If you didn't like it, give me a bad review. I don't care. Just review me. And be sure to get my free video on three ways to get laid more frequently without begging. Opt in at oldguytalks.com. Don't be that guy that just takes in the information. Take action. Without action, you're not going to get the results you want.